<laughs> you ready? Hi. All right, I'm gonna admit all. Here they come. Hey. Hi. Uh, greetings, everyone. Happy Thursday. Carolina Wheats. We're here with Ashley Lyon tonight, the Thursday virtual live studio visit and interview that Art Fair hosts. Uh, thank you so much for joining. We have uh, a special guest tonight, Ashley Lyon. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thanks for joining everybody. You're in your studio. I am, yes. A stone yeah. throw away from you. Yeah, right now. Um, and yes, you are a Newberg, correct? Yes, uh, my studio is here and I live here as well. Very, very good. Yeah, you can see all that space behind you. It's not so much a city space. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, we moved to Newburgh almost four years ago now, uh, pretty much for the big studio spaces that are more affordable here. So right. yeah, it's amazing space. I know, and yeah, I can see some of the work behind you. I'm super excited to start talking about, but I wanted to just quickly kind of go over that. Um, did you see that New York Times article about the was the gem of the Hudson Valley or something? I did, <laughs> and I sort of thought, uh oh, I and it's good. I don't know. <laughs> I know. I know it is a little scary, and uh, uh, my partner Liz, for those of you who know don't know, uh, was reading the article to me while we were sitting having breakfast one morning, and um, she saw my disdain through my face and she, she just kind of in the middle of the article goes, uh, do you want me to stop reading? And I was like, can you please stop reading? It just reminded me of Detroit all over again. So I was, just, you know, yeah. You find thing and you, you, you want to make it, you know, artistic and activate it and, and um, you know, bring the creativity. Uh, and then it gets like overpriced. And that is not right. what we want. Right. Well, and it's been a really great community here so far. So, I mean, we want more people who are interested in the same things, but it's also, yeah, it could just kind of get overblown really fast and change and uh, too quickly. So I don't know. You were here for, you were in Newburgh, New York, uh, then, and it's only 60 miles north of Grand Central, as we know, so it's really easy to go back and forth to the city to see galleries. I did a gallery hopping today, actually. Folks are still entering, so I'm just going to keep going here. But um, what were you doing during quarantine, Ashley? How did you cope or manage? Were you, were you able to get to your studio and, and make work? Yeah, well, luckily... Um... My studio is a private studio, so I uh, share it with my partner. Uh, he has his area over there, and um, that meant that I could come and go as much as possible, which was fantastic. I feel so fortunate for that. Um, but uh, I have a, a two-year-old. Uh, at the time, she was not two. She was like one and a half at the start of COVID, and uh, she was home with us because her daycare closed for about five months. So that shifted like how often I'd be able to come here, even if it was mine to come to. And um, also I teach full time. So uh, I was kind of doing that quick pivot and trying to figure out, you know, um, how to suddenly teach ceramic classes via Zoom and my students, you know, without supplies and things like that. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was just a really busy time. Uh, it was kind of hard to get into the studio. I also felt really, um, I, for at least for the first month or two, I felt really confused. Um, you know, like being at the studio felt strange and pointless and it just sort of, uh, I think I was processing everything really emotionally. My father had just gone through uh, really serious uh, open heart surgery and my stepsister had just gone through open heart surgery for breast cancer, uh, both in the start of March and all those things were like imploding on my life along with COVID. So I felt super paralyzed uh, in the studio for a bit of time, but, um, luckily I had a piece, a big piece that I had started 
um, before COVID and it was near uh, the stage, uh, the sort of mold making stage, which I don't always use for pieces, but I did for this particular piece. And that gave me something to just go to the studio and do that didn't require um, a lot of heavy thinking. If you, you know, it, it's a more technical process. It was really time consuming technically. So that carried me through for um, a month or two until I was in a better state of mind to be here. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there are over everyone's different experiences through lockdown as artists, as makers, as creators, folks that make stuff, produce stuff that are just that question of, is this, is this important? Comes up with a lot of folks, you know, the, 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 is this futile? Like, are there things that I need to be doing be beyond art right now? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of folks were thinking about their role in um, the, the pandemic, but also their role as artists in um, the uprising. And we talked about to many artists over the nine months and Thursdays about um, all sorts of feelings about that. And I'm glad you had that piece. And I think the piece you're referring to is just over your left shoulder. Yeah, that's <laughs> is that right? Can we go yeah. over there? <laughs> Um, here, let's see. Yeah, so this piece, actually, um, this piece is titled Mother. And um, I actually, it's taken me about a year. It's not entirely done. This is actually like the, uh, the test run of the cast. So uh, my work is hand built um, from clay. And I'm gonna set this back down just so I don't drop my computer, but I can stand back up in a minute. Um, so I hand build uh, with clay, uh, coil building, and I make everything from observation or memory. Like I don't make casts of bodies or my body or people's bodies. Um, and then, but then sometimes like pieces take me months and this particular piece has taken over a year to just sculpt. So. Um, sometimes when there's a piece like that, I will then make a mold at the um, end of sculpting it because uh, ceramics is such a technical process and firing really large pieces, you're, you're sort of um, guaranteed some level of failure, which is part of ceramics beauty and pain. So I can't afford to, you know, spend another year remaking a piece. So I'll, I'll pull a mold of it. Um, so that I can make it faster should I need to remake the work if anything goes awry um, in the making of it or in the firing of it. So anyways, yeah, that's this piece. Um, I had sculpted in clay first and then I um, spent that sort of month that I described in the start of COVID um, doing a rubber mold that ended up being two, three, four, five, six. I think it's like a 18 piece rubber mold. And this is a cast in plaster of that mold. Um, it's pretty much like an exact replica of the piece I sculpted. But um, the, the quick cast in plaster was to kind of just see how the mold turned out and like um, figure out anything I needed to change. And eventually I will using the mold, I will remake the piece in clay that can withstand a firing. The initial clay I used also can't withstand the firing process for something so tall. So right. is that a little, maybe a little confusing. Well, the kiln I can only imagine needs to be pretty mammoth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, um, fortunately where I teach, we do have a tall kiln, but it's not as tall as this piece. And the um, the way that heat, when you fire to, you know, over 2000 degrees, you're dealing with a lot of pressure in relation to heat, physical pressure. So um, the way that that affects a piece uh, can cause the top of it to sort of shrink differently than the bottom or be heated at a different rate. And mm -hmm. then you'll get a big crack in the middle. So, um, so yeah, I have to, I have to basically remake this thing using my mold in a different clay if I hope to have it survive the firing, which I will do. Um, but for now I have this kind of 
prototype of the piece. And uh, yeah. yeah, and I guess um, I was fortunate enough to see it in person a few times, and then also in some of its iterations as you've moved. And you kind of started with the bodice first, right? You were hand building the torso, and then um, also the 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 child the toddler figure and then you place the figure on top of that torso or did you build from there is that a two-piece deal I guess yeah it's a two-piece deal um I could lift the toddler off but I'm not going to uh but <laughs> just in case but uh because it's sort of balanced on there kind of precariously but um yeah whenever I build a full figure I usually start at the feet or whatever is touching you know the ground and I kind of build up from the feet just in these coils it's actually hollow on the inside and it's just kind of pinching coils along and sculpting them and then I spend hours and hours sort of zoned out just sculpting yeah. all the details and um, geeking out on rendering flesh because I really enjoy that <laughs> and um, and so yeah built it about up to here and then started the the child and I don't I didn't sculpt her sitting on top of me but I would frequently move her over uh, the original so this piece really brought me out of um, a different kind of paralysis that I had after having a kid and I didn't make any work for maybe six months or so and then a good friend um, Anna Adler curated me into a show uh, titled Smother which with the s in parentheses and it was a uh, show that kind of was born out of her experience of postpartum so it was all um, parents invited who were making work uh, that would related to you know having children um, on some level and that really like got me into the studio because I had the vision for this piece but originally I was um, going to be holding my child and this happens to me a lot like halfway through or partway through um, I have a sort of different vision for its outcome and I just sort of saw the uh, potency of being truncated right at the breasts and then she's on top of me so um, she's kind of completing me she is um, I'm a pedestal for her um, she's sort of on her own I'm I don't have arms to hold her uh, there's kind of all sorts of ways that you can read what that is and it's it's definitely a reflection of that time and kind of the really complicated um, feelings of, of being a mother. And um, like you feel so many different things at once. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's, that's what this piece uh, became uh, to reflect. Yeah, it feels, I mean, I think that visually it's saying all the things that you're you know, sharing right now. Yeah. Um, the seriousness of the, uh, toddler figure on the, the headless mother, you know, and, and the armless mother or the pedestal. I, I appreciate that you're using, using those terms because quite literally and metaphorically, um, as we lift our children up and, you know, want them to be in our own image, we also want them to be their own person, you know, yet we can only give them so much. But, you, you know, when we were, um, we've discussed work before, but learning more about um, certainly the work pre-motherhood and work post-motherhood, but this, this particular work is post-motherhood. Um, the idea of the matrescence, how do you pronounce it? I think it's um, matrescence like adolescence. Yeah. Oh. It's it's from, it's kind of um, sharing some terminology with adolescence, yeah. So, yeah, not my term, it's um, Alexandra Sachs. And actually, I don't even know if it's exactly her term, but it's um, kind of buried in, in uh, some early uh, kind of theory. But yeah. basically, she's, a, she's a, a therapist. And somehow I came across her and her work, um, uh, her more, you know, written work and, and um, scientific work. And she uh, was really bringing this term to light and mostly, I think, to help 
new mothers kind of cope with the feel like these really common feelings that a lot of times get misdiagnosed as postpartum depression, but the women aren't really depressed. And I think I was feeling the same thing. Like, okay, I, this is so different than I thought, you know, I'm not always enjoying every single second of it. I thought I was supposed to, you know, this is really exhilarating. This is really amazing. It's so empowering. And then it's like, oh my God, this is so grueling. <laughs> and, and you kind of, you certainly lose yourself. Um, you know, you're born into a new person and that's, that's what that term is. It's supposed to, um, it's supposed to reference the birth of a mother in, in just like what you go through in adolescence where like your hormones are going bonkers and you don't even know why you're doing certain things. And you're just kind of feeling super confused or conflicted. Like I had a pretty easy going adolescence. I don't think I had that problem, but, but, uh, maybe I paid for it later, you know, certainly after having a kid, it was like, this is just so weird. And, um, like hormonally, I don't even know like what is going on. And, and so, yeah, that really, um, her, that term and the way that she talked about, um, the kind of spiritual birth of a mother too, just rang home for me and it gave me something to really anchor to. And my work did not, um, it obviously didn't directly involve any references to motherhood prior to having Vivian, but um, I was often making uh, the Christ child and I don't know, there's just a whole bunch of sort of buried work now, but <laughs> there was a lot of, a lot of baby Jesuses and <laughs> at one point. And I think I've always been really interested in children. Um, uh, you know, they're kind of a nice size to sculpt. <laughs> so, so there was something that just, I didn't, I didn't want to be the mother making artwork about motherhood. Like that did not appeal to me at all. I was really uh, timid about entering that kind of subject matter and, and category. Um, I don't know why I just kind of had like a bad taste, but yeah. I, then I just, there was no other like, of course I'm going to do this. Like I, I sculpt hyper-realistic things that are related to my personal life. Like <laughs> she's in it, she's all of it. So, um, yeah. There's no shame in that, you know, and, and of course you know that, but it does within the realm of being a female artist, you know, the, the question of motherhood does come into play for those breeders out there and for non-breeders alike. Um, whether or not they're, you know, sufficient in the social, you know, norms of, um, you know, their their cis basic genders or whatever. If they if they are female and female identifying, and then their pressure of having children and being a mother is, and we could talk forever about that one. However, the ideas too of um, the the blessing and the the curse, you know, so it's it's always a blessing. But the but this feeling that everyone, you know, prior to having children, this I I'm going I'm going to be a mother. I must have a I must have a child. You know, this I don't know if you know anyone like this, females in particular. Maybe their clock is ticking, as they say, and they're just like, I've got to have a baby. They're baby crazy, yeah. and the baby craziness. You, I, I'm I'm referring to because. It's that real veil that folks kind of fantasize about having a child and forgetting that you bring someone into the world and you're responsible for them. <laughs> really? a way, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically, all the things. And so that where you lose the sense of yourself, a lot of times having a child hanging off you, even not able to use the restroom or do anything for months, um, you just, you know, vessel and then you're a jungle gym. And then, you know, it's just that everything you just give, you're just constantly giving, you know, and, and, and ensuring that your child is safe in this world. And it also makes me think a little, this work, um, and I, I do want to see some more of your realistic um, sculptures because you, you, 
you really do have a wonderful way of bringing um, ceramic to life, uh, things that you, you wouldn't expect. The thing too with this idea of motherhood, uh, being a female or female identifying person and growing up as a child and that innocence, and then you have the next phase is virgin, right? And then you have then the, the mother, right? And then it's the crone. And my older friends, we would always kind of like, when I was in the 20s and 30s, I remember some of my older friends would be like, oh, I'm not a crone yet, but I'm definitely over motherhood. So you know, there's this like sweet spot depending on when you have your children, you know, 45, 50 to 60, 65, where you're not the crone yet. Like you have a little bit of active wisdom and there's this, this I, I just hope to have a conversation with other uh, female identifying folks um, to, to kind of act, act and, and name maybe that kind of exciting part of like the middle age for a while. It's like, Post mother, but pre like old wise crone, I think it's called, you know, and I, I know that there's plenty of feminists out there that talk about um, this kind of active wisdom. But there's the, but the term for this, that it falls in line with this like adolescence, matricence, and then I don't, <laughs> crone sense, I don't know. <laughs> Exactly. What I see over your right shoulder too is these mammoth breasts. Torso <laughs> is fantastic. Good thing oh. we're not on Instagram live. I wouldn't have to do like little block outs on those nipples. Oh yeah, sorry. I mean the boobs is just the body part. But um <laughs> yeah, these this is what I'm working on currently. And the top is going to be um, flat. So it's a little confusing to maybe see it at this like work in progress stage, but you can get a little peek in at like some of this coil building that I'm doing and how the inside is like hollow. Um, but yeah, oh. this piece, um, uh, again, is just sort of like a, like a vision for it one day. Um, and usually that's kind of how like my ideas come to me and then that helps me like get into the studio. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the piece, it's, it's funny cause like, of course you're gonna think, okay, this is about breasts. Um, and it is like, because it's a giant thing of breasts but um, it's kind of actually about fat. <laughs> so. <laughs> So, you know, my, your boobs change so much when you get pregnant and, and then after the baby too, um, just because of like natural processes and your body does. Um, oh. And my body was like accumulating fat. Um, like this piece is really about like right here. And, and sort of like extra little roll that happens between the breasts and the armpit. And then also in the back, um, you can't really see it so much, but you can see it in this piece, like this, where is it? Like this sort of line that, um, it also like shows up from your stomach stretching out and then like this extra skin that ends up kind of whipping back on your body. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, like a lot of the times that I'm making stuff, actually pretty much all the time I am processing. Um, it's, it's part of what was so conflicting to me about having a child and then suddenly having to like juggle studio time and things like that like my studio time is um I now recognize as like a super important meditative time where I'm just pretty much like lost in my head and you know my thoughts are going all sorts of places and those like it's hours of time that sort of built into my work and I really need that space it's a lot of like alone time um I don't know why I was, I, I think I went off on a little bit of a tangent there, uh, but, but, oh, I guess, so yeah, the, the like processing time, like a lot of times there's sort of this vision for a piece. And then while I'm making the piece, I'm figuring out what, what it's about. And I'm thinking about all of that. And so as I've been making this piece, I've just been thinking about like these different um, parts of flesh on my body and my and it's sort of like this awareness of my changing changing body and then you know 
I think every uh, person who gives birth and uh, is able to also um, raise that child in the first year has a, um, a, a breastfeeding sort of story. And, you know, so I definitely like the, you know, the way that like this part of your body is so complicated and tied to your brain and tied to this person. And it's just, um, you know, I was thinking about a lot of those things and yeah, it's like my pieces kind of end up being this, this like pondering. And the, you know, the fleshy, um, I just love fleshy stuff. So <laughs> boobs are pretty great. They're very fleshy, very fatty, and are just really in the way that you're um, sculpting them. And I'm very thankful that we were able to see the actual um, inside of the hollowness, understanding that you are working to really create the, the, the that realism to the clay. Your realism, whether it's flesh, but also soft, um, meaty or textures like a pillow or a blanket or um, other, you know, things that you've sculpted. And I know that, do you have any of those around the studio? We can look really quickly just to get a sure. good idea. If you got your computer there. Thank you for being careful with your computer. <laughs> That's all right. Um, yeah, I'll take you over here to, um, I happen to have a lot of work out because I was recently photographing it. But um, yeah, so all, all my work is hand sculpted and like I mentioned, sort of coils. Um, so this piece that looks like a blanket um, is actually a rigid clay that's been dyed. Um, it's actually all like the clay is entirely this kind of blue color. Um, and the spots underneath there are like, is from mold as I built it. Cause um, sometimes it takes me so long to build things that they accumulate a bunch of mold that stains the piece. Um, but yeah, and I've, I've been using a lot of like pigmented clay bodies. Um, so that, that clay is pigmented with cobalt, uh, which is really sensitive to temperature. And so you can actually kind of even see a little bit of like where the color differentiates across the piece. Um, and that mm. just had to do with where it was in the kiln and uh, the height of the kiln and just like this, like a two, probably a two or three degree temperature difference. Um, so then uh, there's this other kind of series of more um, fabric and sort of soft plushy pieces. Um, again, these are all, you know, ceramic. Um, these are not uh, pigmented clay. Instead, they are painted with a combination of um, matte medium, plaster, and watercolor. Um, for sort of, I, I like a really, um, I don't often use glazes or actually I never use glazes or any ceramic surfaces because I don't like how they reflect light. Um, I really like the uh, more like how a matte surface absorbs light and um, yeah, so, and, and also like I have a lot more control with cold surfaces. So, so this is another piece that's, it's hollow clay. I know probably on the uh, video here, it looks like I'm just showing you a crumpled duvet, but it's actually a ceramic piece <laughs> and, um, and it's rigid. And, uh, and these pillow pieces, the brush here is not ceramic, that just, <laughs> left over there <laughs> but um yeah and I I really like rendering um I'll show you two other pieces here the leg that was on our kind of promotional piece and oh, yeah. this like wig um yeah I, I really enjoy rendering fabric and fiber materials um and sometimes when I make things, I kind of like, like the duvet, um, that pink duvet, like I just spread the real one right next to it and just kind of start sculpting once I have it in a position that I like. 
Um, but those pieces, let's see, content wise, the blue blanket, the first one I showed you, um, I made that piece uh, after the uh, Malaysian Airlines crash over the Ukraine in Ukraine. Um, it was like 2014, 2015 that that happened and 2014. Um, and I was just really struck. I read this New York Times article that was talking about the debris field and describing like a shoe and somebody's bra and like part of an airline blanket in this field. And it was just really, um, I'm really interested in what I call figurative objects. So objects that carry uh, a kind of presence. Uh oh, you're frozen. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, objects that carry a kind of like presence with them of the user or the person or they kind of like transmute uh, a person's presence into the object itself. And so there was this blanket that, um, that had been in our home and I had been wanting to sculpt it. And something about that reading that article in the debris field just like kicked that into place for me. Um, so I kind of made that piece about that airline crash and probably like fear of um, mortality. And also, uh, and, and then I kind of discovered the colored clay and that's what I've been doing uh, for a while since, uh oh, where did you go? Something must have happened. Lena, are you back? <laughs> I'm back. Okay, good. Could, did you hear any of that? I heard a lot of it. I heard that the, um, about the debris from the plane and these random uh, moments of just being without a human, you know, personal. Then, then I then I was gone. Okay. Well, I, I don't know what else everybody else heard, but um, then soon after that blue blanket piece, I was invited to do the show um, Modern Domestics as a two person show at Jane Lumber Gallery. And the, because it was two person, we were sort of trying to connect the work on a common thread. And so Modern Domestics is where we landed. And that, um, so a lot of those other uh, more household pieces I made um, in relation to that subject matter. And we had just moved here to Newburgh and we're restoring this home. And I was thinking a lot about the things that you, you know, bring with you to a home, um, like from home to home. Like this is, this is like, a, um, these are replicas of these pillows that I think my parents probably had like before I even existed. Uh, that somehow are in my house and you know I can tell from the pattern that they're from like the 70s and so so there's kind of um you know there's like this weird I have a lot of attachment to objects um I, I experience like uh, a lot of I'm a very emotional person it clearly drives a lot of my work and uh uh, so I was just kind of examining my relationship to these these objects and these things that I am or am not attached to and how um, kind of what we have in our home can really reflect some aspect of who we are other than in the obvious way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're so elegant. Uh, potentially, they're then presented on the floor. Like when Jane Lombard, that show, did you have small pedestals uh, or how, how were they presented? Yeah, I actually had them on the pedestals that they're in here. Um, okay. Go back over to some of them here. Uh, so yeah, I, I built these pedestals for them just because they actually couldn't be on the floor. Um, I, yeah, it just kind of didn't quite work. But um, so this was another piece that was kind of based on this like egg crate foam that I keep dragging from studio to studio <laughs> and this this piece was not in that show but this piece I typically prefer to show it on the ground um, it's been in a couple other exhibitions it's a lot more uh, poignant I think when it's on the actual same ground that we're standing on so you can kind of like people tend to get a little lost in it just staring at it and um, but I've had two people 
come within inches of stepping on it. Like, I think actually one person might've stepped on it and I, I kind of mm -hmm. grabbed them at the same time. It was during my opening and I, I like pulled them back, but so there's a risk, you know, especially because they are handmade and, you know, I can remake it, but um, it'll be different. So, yeah. Right. And I have a question. I don't know if you spoke to the grid pattern in the uh, blankets yet. I was curious about your intentions there, whether it was, was it functional uh, for, for you know, getting it in the kiln and out and, and had you found any kind of other intention as you looked at it compiled on the floor and do you place it close enough that you can't see the grid ever yeah it's it's about as close as it can get like there's a little there's a few moments where you see the grid um it's things move in the firing so it's not mm -hmm. it's almost impossible to make it like exact where it would puzzle piece just perfectly together but uh i gridded it because it had to fit in the kiln and there isn't a kiln this wide um east of the mississippi basically so uh <laughs> so so this was to make it fit although you know there is like an aesthetic choice in how i gridded it up that it wasn't tiny tiles or extra big tiles um i don't know if i can really speak to what that aesthetic choice was just that I know I was making it and um you know people have talked about because I talk about that airline flight and the the like debris yeah. field people have brought up the kind of gridding that they do when there's like an area to be surveyed um and certainly it has a you know reference uh it, it makes people think of water and all that so I think that there's a lot of places that you can go with that but my my choice it was it was purely functional yeah. Um, yeah i do enjoy puzzle piecing it back together every time i set it up though you know because <laughs> i have to figure out <laughs> the cobalt color too the fact that you used genuine cobalt i find really compelling because cobalt itself is not only the color cobalt but also the material it's a mineral is that right or it's it's a pigment but it's it's of the earth and um it's been used for centuries and lore or whatever for um emotional protection it uh it, there's like witches will tell you and all those mystics out there i don't know who those i don't, I don't know a lot of them but you know i, I have i've heard a couple of folks out there talk about how cobalt uh repels negative energy and repels like malevolence and ghosts that are naughty and just, you know, um, <laughs> demonic forces. Uh, I giggle when I say that because I know that sounds pretty extreme, but you know, just like it's, it takes away bad energy, supposedly cobalt does for 500 to medieval times. And it was kind of this special thing you would put in water underneath your bed or near your bed in order to dispel that negative energy and spirits. And I just kind of like the idea that it's in this blanket, this comforting, um, yet very stiff post plane crash. You know, my, my mind is wandering, you're gonna have to forgive me. But did you, did you know that about cobalt? I did not know that about cobalt. Um, really, mostly what I knew about it when I was making the piece was just that it was a carcinogen. And so I was, I was really excited about, uh, I kind of stumbled into with that piece and um, this other piece I have that is out of black clay. Um, oh. It was making those two pieces that it was like a, a light bulb went off for me because I hate the glazing look of ceramics, like I said, and I just couldn't figure out what else I could do that wasn't necessarily painting a surface because I'm also not that interested in a surface. Um, I just kind of want the piece to have its color as I've built it and that's it. Um, but so much of the time I was sort of faced with like, what do I do with the surface of this thing? So the staining the clay itself was like, yes, this is the answer. I don't have to worry about a surface at all. Um, but the all the stains to make these really great colors like these two pieces here are also um, clay that has been stained um, so the red and the yellow 
um, are stained with mason stains, but all of those are really toxic. And I really need to like use my fingertips to sculpt. I can't do it with gloves. Oh, wow. And so I got, I got really into all this, this uh, stained clay, but then was suddenly like, oh my gosh, I'm, I might be, you know, poisoning myself here. And at a time when I was also kind of trying to get pregnant, I was like, uh, this is a problem because <laughs> so, I'm also I sort of make a mess like I I'm not a contained ceramic artist I'm like you know carving away and there's stuff on the floor and it's just it's a hot mess until the end so um, I know that uh, so I gave that a little bit of a break like using the colored uh, clays but I can I can start again um, now I'm I'm free to do that in a more safe manner. Uh, yeah, so I didn't know, I didn't know that about the cobalt, but I love that. And uh, I think the part that you missed, and maybe I also didn't even say, was that I was modeling this blanket off of a blanket that looked to me to be somebody's blankie, and yes. that. It, it, it like it was pilled like there's this really subtle texture I think you've probably seen in this piece in person and it was pilled up from washing and from rubbing and from use and um just those like those objects we get so attached to like that right and it was super thin it, it's I don't know where it is now um but just it kind of had that that essence to it and I think there's things like that that really I connect to emotionally and then I feel mm -hmm. And the work is it's muted colors, how it's kind of, you know, these dull clay dyes, stains, um, the muted colors, and also it's, it's kind of like this memorialization of these objects, since you're talking about the sentimentality in the objects, the, mm -hmm. the way that the quilt in particular is like folded so nice, like it's supposed to go in the closet like that, like that's how you're supposed to remember it, mm -hmm. um, although quilts can get pretty ratty with use. Yeah as you're talking about the pilling of the blanket yet is there anything i mean do you when you're sculpting these works in you know hyper realism like the like you are um are you are you thinking about the memorialization i mean or are you just really loving the objects like for instance you know, do you, do you go back to those objects and think, all right, I've, I've got this, I've got this now, like almost like a, a trophy of the object before it gets, you know, completely battered and, and, and beaten up. Yeah. Um, no, that, that's a great, that's a great question. I appreciate you asking it. Um, it's, I am, a, I do get attached to things. I'm a really sentimental person. Um, and I have a lot of nostalgia and it's like the worst thing that could happen in my life would be my house burning down, you know, like losing everything. Not that we're, I mean, there's worse things obviously, but you know what I mean? Like it's, it's one of my bigger fears and uh, because I'm so sentimental, but I'm not making any of the objects to preserve them should a disaster like that happen. And as I'm making them, I don't, I'm not spending a tremendous amount of time sentimentalizing over them. Um, you know, that rolled up quilt like that, it's my grandmother's quilt that she made when she was probably like 13 or something. And, but it's yeah, like, yes, that content is in the work. Um, I've picked that object probably it, it, because of that, but it's really just, um, I think I see a thing that I just really want to sculpt and I kind of get to geek out over sculpting it. And I, and I want to spend time with it. You know, um, is there some sort of super close looking, super focused time that I then get to like spend with that object, but it's a little bit divorced from the cement sediment sentimentality of it. Um, yeah. I don't quite know how to describe it. It's, the, the inspiration is probably related to a sentimentality, but the, the reason then I've made it isn't. And, and right. I, I, I want to connect to something bigger than me. You know, I'm not, I'm not looking to like really talk about my grandmother or her quilt or, you know, yeah. um, to like yeah. share that with somebody else. Like, why do they care? They don't care. You know, um, 
I'm, I'm really like, I think I love the, the pleasure from sculpting something representationally and the moment that it just like nails that, you know, the weight of those breasts or like the fold of that, that um, quilt and it's the uncanniness, um, you know, my, my work certainly has a lot more to do with like perceptions of realism and, and trying to kind of bring about that uncanny sensation and then connect with somebody that way, you know? So it's more that than their, than their subject matter. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that so much. And even thinking as you're speaking to the, the earlier pieces, your current works in the figurative realm, the, I, I dare I belabor the point, but basically that child is memorialized on that torso at that size. And, you know, that, that, that's the size, that's the size of the toddler and that's the size of the sculpture, you know, but we know that that toddler that was based on that sculpture is no longer that size, right? And also when you're talking about the little folds above the breast, you know, the little like chicken wing part. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got it too. I know the feeling, but you know, I mean, when, when we're thinking about that, I mean, that also is like, well, if you start doing some push-ups, you know, the breastfeeding that dries up, you know, things change, our bodies change. It's just like in, in reference to inanimate objects versus animate objects or humans and, and figurative forms. I think that, that um, the concept of capturing time is, is um, maybe more prevalent because the figure is so ever-changing and all that to say that you are so careful and um, your skills are so fine-tuned in clay to be able to <laughs> render a quilt or a blanket or a pillow or flesh. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I suppose that's a statement less than a question, but do you, I mean, those breasts, I mean, what are they slated for? Are you gonna put it on a pedestal? Are they gonna have a torso? Are they just gonna lay there? Are they gonna be like, you know, five foot high in the air? Or are they gonna be on the floor? Where, where do you imagine your viewer taking those babies in? Um, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> talking about this. Um, I, I'm not sure yet what, so the top is gonna be flat. I like this height. Um, yeah. I could also see them being on the ground. Uh, I, I cut it off at a really specific point where I wanted it to kind of feel like it, it is just cut, but it also sort of looks like the breasts are like resting and that, that weight. Um, so that was very intentional. And the top, the top is gonna be flat. I've been thinking, do I put something on top of it? But I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to do that. Um, so I, I don't have a full plan for how that's going to end. Um, but I've also like this piece and a piece I completed just before the Swan Meteor, which was um, this cast of my child's foot that I uh, made extra large. I'm gonna walk you over to that one. Um, Cause you saw, you saw that one at um, the White Rock exhibition. Um, yes. Yeah, so this is like, I snuck into Vivian's room while she was napping and did a little alginate cast of her foot. Uh, and she woke up in the middle of it and that was really bad. Um, but, <laughs> but my poor child who's now like subject to being part of my art, uh, whether she likes it or not. But this was, this was the little tiny cast and I just love this object. I mean, talk about something I'm gonna be sentimental and nost nostalgic about and like never yeah. want to. I have a couple of those hand versions. Yeah, and it is time. I mean, her foot will never be this again. And it's so, it's so fucking precious, I'm sorry. But, um, so I just wanted to do something with this object. And then I was invited to this um, show that was an outdoor sculpture show and I've never made an outdoor sculpture. And so it was like, oh God, yes, I'm just gonna make this huge and it's in a big field and it's a meteor. And this is what this like tiny foot feels like to me and um and that's also clay or did you temper it for outdoors 
it's clay and then I covered it with wax, um, trying to kind of figure out an outdoor situation, but I had to take it in before the like freeze thaw time because it, mm. it needed a glaze or it needed to be built out of different clay to like really withstand a winter. Um, mm. But that scaling up, that's the first time I've really scaled up that I can recall. And so that is kind of led to this piece being scaled up too. And I think I saw, somewhere in here, like the very first comment was someone brought up Viola Frey. And I've been thinking about Viola Frey a lot. Um, whoever brought that up, thank you. You know, she she's just like a powerhouse ceramic sculptor. Um, she made these huge figures that would have these kind of like sections, a lot like the, the cut that one does, but they were full figures. And her sections were there just for a practical reason to put them in kilns and ship them and stuff like that. Um, but there's pictures of her and she's just, you know, up on a ladder, like building these huge forms. And I think, I think she passed away um, younger than she should have, um, I believe maybe from cancer, but um, she just made this incredible work. And I, it wasn't work I was initially drawn to, but now I kind of can't stop thinking about just how badass that was, like, and the scale of it. And um, a couple years ago, I started working bigger scale. This is like in large scale, but I was just working on big scale ceramic pieces and I love it. Like I love, I hate, I hate having to figure out how to fire it. I hate having to move it. I hate that I can't move it by myself. I hate storing it. All those things are awful. Um, but, but I really like building it. I made this, um, this big sarcophagus piece that's actually like the size of a sarcophagus. And that maybe maybe was the, the initial part of it. And it's like the speed of the building and the sculpting. I mean, I made the piece in like two weeks and you know, you kind of have to work. I don't know, it, my, my pace is all over the place, but um, there's, mm -hmm. you know, just working at this larger scale is really exciting to me. And I, I want to keep making work like that. And I'm, I'm definitely thinking a lot of Viola Frey as like someone who gave um, specifically ceramic of making women, you know, permission for that and kind of like held a torch to that, which is mm -hmm. awesome. Um, but time, you were, you were bringing up time and uh, I don't think I had thought too much about freezing time you know, or anything really bringing time as like content into my work. But since I started uh, making work that involves my child, like the time is so, it's, it's so present, the, the concept of time, um, not like no studio time, but that too, <laughs> but <laughs> more, more, um, um, more like the, the concept of, um, you know, yeah, she's, she, she's not that size anymore. And that's not the size of her foot anymore. And, um, my body's different from the time. And I made the, the toddler here over, I don't know, close to a year of her life. So as I was sculpting it, she kept getting bigger. And then I'd make another part and it would be too big for the other part. <laughs> so she's sort of like, this is like seven to 14 months. So like it kind of crosses all of that scale. Um, stop growing. <laughs> yeah, stop growing so I can sculpt you, David. <laughs> if you if you were in um, a course, you know, your professor being like, you know, I don't know, but the perspective this leg is a little bigger than this one. You know, your foreshortening isn't on right now. <laughs> like, tell my child to stop growing. Well, that must have been a challenge then. And 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 yeah. then did you just have to keep making it bigger until fourteen months? I think I stopped maybe somewhere around 11 months and then kind of had to, to fib or like, luckily I take a lot of pictures, you know, um, yeah. phone overflowing with reference photos of her or other things. So that, that helps me along the way. Yeah. But it's, you know, a lot, any of my figurative stuff is like anatomically I've had one time a doctor came to like an open studio thing. He's like, that arm's broken. I'm like, well, probably, you know, like I never took, they're sculpting um, or anatomy classes or anything. And 
my students want me to teach them that. And I'm like, hey, but I can, I can teach you how to like make something feel like a body, you know? And that, that's what I learned actually from um, some of my best professors. It's like, how do you make something really feel like what it is to be human or like what it is to have flesh? And, and that's what I look for. That's what I'm, that's where I stop. You know, that's what I'm after when I'm, when I'm sculpting things. And that, that's the punk them, you know, that's the thing I want. That's, that's a really great sentiment and it really helps um, give us, you know, a, a little more of a piece of you. Uh, I, I love that. And um, can you remind everyone where you're teaching? Oh yeah, um, at New Jersey City University. Uh, so I teach, art. Um, I run the ceramic program uh, specifically. So, um, or I'm just sort of the, the main full-time faculty in ceramics and also the graduate coordinator of the whole art department. Uh, so yeah, I get to engage in a lot of that. Um, and it's good. Yeah, and you, were, you were teaching through lockdown virtually. And I know we only have five more minutes, but I find this so fascinating. It's just teaching ceramics <laughs> online. Can you talk briefly about how you figured out how to do that successfully, or at least manage to do it so it's effective and they're getting these, you know, tr the training? Yeah, yeah. Um, I had to, yeah, it was very challenging. It still is really challenging. Um, I really had to scale back my expectations. I have very high expectations of my students and I really push them in the classroom to make things larger than they can imagine and um, to just kind of not be afraid and to plunge into projects. And I found very quickly that that was you know not only not possible in their homes but um, not possible over Zoom, so it's a different kind of energy that you're imparting through a virtual thing. And um, uh, you know a lot of uh, not all my students, but the majority of my students are um, that they don't necessarily have a home life that they might not even have a table to be working on, or they might have young children who are going to get into the clay or whatever. So I had to design kits that were really kind of uh, foolproof, if you will, you know, that, that hopefully didn't have anything too sharp or too toxic and really think through every single uh, material or tool that the student might need in case they ran into this issue as they built this piece or that issue as they built that piece. And so the students pick up these kits like contactless um, in the first or second week. And I give them lots of warning that, you know, they, they will be taking this kit home and this material that does have a, a level of toxicity to it. So, you know, if that's not appropriate for them, then find another class. <laughs> um, very nicely, but, uh, or I'll figure out how to accommodate them. But yeah, I prepared these kits and I teach, um, I teach five levels at once. So I had to reinvent curriculum for um, about 25 projects worth that could happen at home. And it's really challenging um, because it was challenging in the classroom anyway like it's like a one-room schoolhouse and I'm usually running around like a chicken with their head cut off like okay here's how you do guys do this okay do that great don't cut your arm off okay let's have, you know and and um so I it's impossible on zoom uh you know and I can't I can't see what they're doing I can't feel I mean I demand that the the screen has to be on and I can see them working but like I can't feel the thickness of something I can't catch something if it goes wrong you know uh, students last semester were like casting plaster and they're having what's called a plaster disaster where the plaster bursts out of the mold and goes everywhere and they only have so much plaster and I, I had to think through like okay how do I prepare them that this could happen because if we're in the classroom I can rush over and plug the hole and we can get more plaster and go again but I'm just watching it unfold and it's like plug the hole plug the hole you know? <laughs> So it's, uh, yeah, it's been, it's, it's also been like a lot of discovery. Um, I really feel uh, lucky to have some of this time where like, I really get a sense of what my students home life is. And it's been really eye opening. Um, and, you know, we've had to kind of reinvent the wheel. So 
we're doing slightly slightly simpler projects than I might have done in the classroom, but it's going okay. And Clay is so therapeutic that uh, I'm I'm really glad that you know my students can have that opportunity for a really to work with a really therapeutic material in this time because some of them really need it, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, just props to you. I really admire what you do, and, and I am often blown away to see your work in real life. I'm lucky to have done that, um, and you. it's been so good talking to you and being in the studio, however virtually, um, and it's already seven. Can you believe it? No, that went really fast, but of course it did. I love talking to you. <laughs> talking to you it just goes so fast and it's um yeah it's so great and I'm really excited to see the end of the sculptures the the, the finale and um and everyone that tuned in thank you so much for joining meeting Ashley seeing Ashley at work and if you miss any of the broadcasts we will certainly be uh posting this recording live on our YouTube channel with 30 plus other ones that we do and we have been doing since the um, gosh since March so next week we have Jonathan Allen and it should be pretty bombastic after the inauguration and with that again thank you madam thank you it's my pleasure absolutely and thanks to everyone else ciao everyone bye bye